So happy to see you here. My name is Virginia Sharp, and I am director of the Center for the Southwest, and I want to welcome you to this year's C. Ruth and Calvin P. Horn and Dad Lecture. This year we're celebrating the 34th anniversary of this prestigious lecture, and the lecture is named for donors Ruth and Calvin Horn, and as we celebrate them, we remember Mrs. Horn, who always was an enthusiastic backer and fan of this lecture. She would have been here, sitting in the front row, so excited to hear our distinguished speakers. And I'm sorry to say we lost her in 2016, but we'll always remember her as a civic leader and a world traveler and somebody who was just a great supporter of the history department and of this program. Now, her husband, Calvin, was a Renaissance man Calvin Horn was a businessman, a state legislator, he was chair of the UNM Board of Regents, and he was also a prolific author of books of New Mexico history. And that's not a combination you see in the modern world, for the most part. We certainly haven't seen his life since. He shared with Ruth a fascination with the history of the American West, and we certainly delight in remembering and honoring today that legacy, and we thank the Horn family for supporting this and all the lectures by distinguished scholars. I also want to thank Melissa Bakaboy and the staff of the History Department. Melissa, if you stand up and let us thank the, you, the chair of the History Department. For well, her visionary leadership of the department and her advocacy for history in the public sphere, and everything that she's done for the humanities here at the University of New Mexico, um, ably assisted by a great staff of the history department headed by Yolanda Martinez. And I also want to thank for supporting the lecture, Professor Chris Wilson and the School of Architecture and Planning, which is co-hosting this event. Professor Alf Simon of the Landscape Architecture Program who designed our amazing poster. And of course, I want to thank the person most responsible for the success of this event and everything sponsored this year by the Center for the Southwest, Kave Mo Bahed, who is a PhD student in U.S. History, grad assistant in the Center. Please take a bow. every single aspect of this event with great creativity and endless good cheer. So thank you for your round of applause for him. He's the best. So I should mention that this is the last time that I will be introducing our Horn lecturers. Um, the Center for the Southwest has hosted the Calvin and Ruth Horn lecture since 2005, and I was director, uh, began as director of the center in 2001. And I feel extraordinarily privileged to have brought some of the best historians working both in and outside of the academy, also organizing myriad conferences, symposium workshop, generating research initiatives and publications, creating opportunities for our students and faculty, instigating many, many, many conversations that would not otherwise have happened. So next year, the Center for the Southwest will have a new director who will bring new ideas, new energy, and new excitement to all of these activities and more. So please stand and be recognized, uh, Professor Sam Truitt. for the center under Sam's leadership. I'm, I'm so excited to be turning things over to him. Uh, it's really been an honor and a privilege to serve the University of New Mexico, the Albuquerque community, the state of New Mexico, and all the great people who care about the history of this country and about history in general. And I want to remind you that we will have a reception after tonight's talk, and there will be refreshments, assuming that they're sitting in the lobby and they haven't been completely stripped to nothing by the architecture students. <laughs> so now, I know Norman Crow's looking at me, goes, you better get somebody out there and watch it. <laughs> so now I have the great pleasure of introducing the 2019 C. Ruth and Calvin P. Horn lecturers, Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf. Over 34 years, we've hosted many distinguished historians, but largely we have focused on scholars who study particularly the American West. But this year, we're expanding the vision of our, um, of our lecture, the scope of the lecture, to understand the ways in which the founders of the nation, the ways in which their vision shaped the American empire. 
You are about to hear from two internationally acclaimed scholars who have reached out to bring history to a wide public in the most rigorous and engaging way. As you will soon see, the format for this year's so-called lecture is a little different. Both of these scholars have remarkable records of achievement in research, writing, teaching, and public engagement. But most recently, they have collaborated on the widely acclaimed book, Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of the, Amer uh, uh, the, Empire of the Imagination, published by Livright in 2016. I'm going to have the honor of serving as interlocutor for a wide-ranging conversation between them, and we're going to be inviting all of you to ask your questions during the last part of this program. Annette Gordon-Reed, seated here to my immediate left, is the Charles Warren Professor of American Legal History at Harvard Law School and a professor of history at Harvard University. Gordon-Reed won the Pulitzer Prize in 2009 for the Hemingses of Monticello, an American Family, W.W. Norton, 2009, a subject she had previously written about in Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, which was published by the University Press of Virginia in 1997. She's also author of Andrew Johnson, Times Books, Henry Holt, 2010, and her honors include a fellowship from the Dorothy and Louis B. Coleman Center for Writers and Scholars at the New York Public Library, a Guggenheim Fellowship in the Humanities, a MacArthur Fellowship, the National Humanities Medal, the National Book Award, and the Woman of Power of and Influence Award from the National Organization for Women in New York City. To her left is Peter S. Onuf, who is the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Professor Emeritus in History at the University of Virginia and Senior Research Fellow at the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. Onuf taught at Columbia University, Southern Methodist University, and the University of Oxford, as well as at UVA. His work on Thomas Jefferson culminating in Jefferson's Empire, The Language of American Nationhood, University Press of Virginia 2000, and The Mind of Thomas Jefferson, 2007, also published by Virginia, as well as Jefferson and the Virginians, Democracy, Constitutions, and Empire, 2018, Louisiana State University Press, grew out of earlier studies on the history of American federalism, foreign policy, and political economy. Onuf, Onuf was a founder of Public Radio's Backstory with the American History Guys. Gordon Reed and Onuf are arguably the two people on the planet today best equipped, best equipped to explore the intellect of Thomas Jefferson, illuminating how his thoughts on home, family, race, slavery, and progress were reflected in his political life. They may also help us to understand how Jefferson's intellectual legacy illuminates both problems and possibilities for our time. Please welcome Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Allen. job is just to start things off and then uh, 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 try to get out of the way while the race goes on. So um, let's start with a question about your title of your book. Uh, you've had years of working together in various capacities in this global community of Jefferson scholars and now you've published a book together. So starting with this title, Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of the Imagination. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you came to settle on that title. Well, I think the first thing to talk about is the punctuation, and I'll turn it over to Annette for that. <laughs> well, I think people should notice that most blessed of the patriarchs is in quotes, and they're typically not quotes on books, book covers. And my editor, our editor, Bob Weil, who's a fantastic editor at Norton, and now he has his own imprint, Live Right, was saying, you can't do that. Don't put quotation marks on books. But I really, really did not want, we didn't want people to think that we were calling him the most blessed of the patriarchs. That this was how he described himself. <laughs> and he described himself this way in a letter that he wrote to Angelica Schuyler Church in 1793. And everybody knows Angelica from the Schuyler sisters. <laughs> <laughs> work, work. And, 
She was someone who knew Jefferson when he was in Paris. She was, as you know, the sister-in-law of Alexander Hamilton. When we started writing this book, we had no idea that anybody would know who Angelica Schuyler Church was. <laughs> and of course, you know, because musical people do know who she, who she was. But anyway, he's writing to her, and he's talking about the fact that he's leaving office, and he's going to go back to Monticello, and he's talking about this sort of wonderful scene that will be there, and he has his fields to farm, and he's going to watch for the happiness of those who labor for mine. Guess who those are? Yes, yeah. those people are enslaved people. And he also goes on to say that if my daughters settle there and they're next to me, then I will consider myself as blessed as the most blessed of the patriarchs. And so that phrase, and we note in the book that he calls himself that um, a patriarch in another letter a couple of years later, talking about himself at Monticello, we thought was fascinating because here's a guy who's considered the sort of avatar, sort of the herald of modernity, of uh, the possible freedom, all of those kinds of things, who's describing himself using that phrase, patriarch. And we thought that that was a good jumping off place to describe his self-image. And the idea in the book, too, when we say this, is that there have been so many books about Jefferson uh, recently, Jefferson and slavery, Jefferson and this, Jefferson and the other thing. Uh, and it's all about sort of saying, we have your number, in other words, looking at him in a skeptical way, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we wanted to try to write about him as he saw himself. What did he, what did this person think he was doing in the world? You know, we have our ideas about what he thought he was doing, and other people comment about it, but this was supposed to be a, a work that looked at his writings and looked at his self-image. How did he see himself in this world? And so the fact that he picked the term patriarch, we thought was actually quite interesting. And it's important to keep that idea of world in mind because Jefferson saw himself in relation to a domestic world of his own. And that notion of patriarchy in Anglo-American law comes naturally to a lawyer like Jefferson because of the legal doctrine of coverture, that is, women don't own property under the common law, and the idea that the male will represent the family. So in the larger society, all men are created equal, as you remember from my necktie, which is the Declaration of Independence. And that notion of equality, then, is, by our standards, limited. It's interesting, in this one letter, he describes himself as the dominant figure in the home, that is, male supremacy. He also invokes the presence of his enslaved people. That's Jefferson, the slave owner. But he also adduces the idea of representation. And that is, he represents his family and his vision for America and for the empire that he sees spreading across this continent all the way to New Mexico and beyond. If you can imagine there being a beyond New Mexico, where there is land enough on this continent for the thousandth to the thousandth generation. So right here we encounter in Jefferson, we identify with the most modern form of government, with rights, with democracy, is situating himself historically at a moment that's foreign to us. With a phrase that we don't, with a phrase that, that's problematic to us, patriarch. Uh, patriarchy, when we certainly in our classes, in my classes in college, and law, at the law school and so forth, that, no, that notion of patriarch is something that's under attack. Um, for all the problems that it entails, all it suggests, but interestingly enough, as Peter is suggesting, he has a vision of himself as a patriarch who is looking out for people. Whereas we see it as a problematic conception, he's talking about the good things that he thinks that he is going to do. Now, of course, that puts him at the center of everything. Everybody else has to go along with that, but he sees himself as benevolent and he's going to do things the right way. And that's what, particularly in 1793, this is, we talk a little bit about how he changes over time, and this is a particular, he has arrived at this particular moment after a number of things that happened from the time of his youth 
up through the revolution, his time in France, all of those things bring him to a point in 1793 when he sees himself as able to go back to Monticello, manage this place, manage the concerns that, that he sort of puts forth there in a benevolent way. Of course, we bristle, you know, watch for the happiness of those who labor for mine. It's like, why can't they watch for their own happiness? Let them go and let them do the best that they can in a world where they could be farmers, in a world where they could be carpenters and so forth. All the skills that people did have at Monticello, why can't they do them? But of course, in his world, his thinking at that particular moment, that is not the time. He's going to do the best that he can in this circumstance. And that word happiness is a key word here. We associate it, of course, with my necktie again, and we pursue happiness and that's what we are entitled to do. Yet Jefferson is looking out for the happiness of his enslaved people. And in return for his benevolence, this blessed patriarch expects, in fact, he believes he is receiving love. Love, of course, from the daughters who will move into his neighborhood but even, and of course this is most profoundly problematic for us, in some sense of the word love, he expects that from enslaved people. And he thinks that he does. He thinks he has it. And one of the things we say, I'm going to let you ask another question, but the other thing that he, he, he has this vision because he is surrounded most intimately, most closely, by a family of people who are connected to his wife, his, his deceased wife, in fact, the half-siblings of his uh, deceased wife, and he sees himself as a slave owner, acting as a slave owner through his relationships with these people, and very, very different from the people down the mountain, but they are the ones who tell him what kind of patriarch he actually is, the people that he sees day to day, and those would be members of the Hemings family. Now, our plan tonight is to work through the entire book by close reading. Uh, we now officially turn to page one of the book. Well, let me say one more thing before we get Virginia back in the picture, and that is there's a reason we chose this title. It seems perverse to us. That's one of the reasons we want to uh, gain your attention. We want you to ask questions. But it's also because, as Virginia suggested in her introduction, we're trying to get past the conventional ways of thinking about Jefferson, which separate private and public, which say, well, Jefferson may have been a slave owner, but he was a great Democrat. He's an iconic figure. And there is this profound contradiction between the Democrat and the slaveholder. And the way most people deal with it is to say, well, how do you deal with it when you deal with modern politicians? You just say, well, hypocrisy, of course. That's the answer. He's, he's, he doesn't mean what he says. But when Annette says we're looking at what he thinks about himself, she means what she says. And so our job, as we took it, is reconstructive, not to rehabilitate him, not to justify him, but to explain why hypocrisy might satisfy you and make us feel good about ourselves, because we are so profoundly morally evolved I don't know, have you looked in the mirror recently and congratulated yourself? No, I'm just joking. That's, uh, that's the beginning of one of my usual sermons, however, uh, leaving that for later. Jefferson, as the most blessed of the patriarchs, believes that he is performing a role in his world that will enable the success of this great experiment in Republican government, and his most profound values are tied up with the way he understands his domestic domain. So let's talk about that. Um, I, I gave them the questions in a particular order. I have a feeling we're going to go in reverse order here. <laughs> so get ready for that. But, uh, you know, so, um, uh, you know, I've observed that there's been a lot of interest in Thomas Jefferson's private life ever since he had one. Uh, so both you and scholars like your good friend, the, uh, the late Jan Ellen Lewis, have done a lot of incredible work showing us not only how Jefferson lived, 
and who he lived with and who he depended on and who depended on him in these kind of reciprocal relationships, but also about the exchanges of power inherent in those relationships. So I want you to talk about the connections between his private world and his public life. So tell us about this. Tell us how, how you think his image of himself as a patriarch surrounded by people whom he both depended on and who depended on him, who he claimed to love, whatever love means, and that's another question altogether. Uh, what's love mean? What's love got to do with this, to coin a phrase? Um, the connections between, between that and the, the, the things for which we celebrate him. You want me to start with that? Well, you start with it. Okay, uh, I'll, Virginia, one word, and that is nature. Jefferson believed that the great problem of his career was to dismantle the old regime, the unnatural world of artificial privilege, of domination, of hierarchy. For him, that idea of a family of families represented by the patriarch was the antithesis of aristocracy and monarchy, with privilege, status, and power descending from generation to generation in a few families. That dynastic history, the lineage of rule across generations, what republicanism means is that we flip that vertical axis onto the horizontal and every man and every family through those men encounter each other as equal. Something that is in Jefferson's world and Jefferson's age unthinkable, the very notion of social order implies, requires, is predicated on hierarchy. That is, you know your place. That idea that's still part of our language comes from the broad acceptance and legal support and sanction and supporting a notion of hierarchy. Nature. So what would be the most natural form of governance? A family is governed, but it's governed not by the props of law and power and coercive force. It's because the relationships of love come with the fundamental bond of a man and wife and the role they play in nurturing the rising generation. Something all of us share, we were all born. Some of you were born again, but we were all born and therefore have that universal experience. And that's not just a trivial biological fact for Jefferson, it's profoundly important because it's on that basis that we can talk about the very idea of equality. And so I would begin, it doesn't answer questions that we are going to explore about, well, what about the enslaved people within this conception of equality? But if you're thinking about a natural relationship and the relationship of parents to children, that's the way we begin. Because of course that relationship is one that's fostered at home, under the domain of the blessed patriarch. But it's one then that ramifies outside of the home. It connects home to home. And what Jefferson imagines as a student of Scottish moral philosophy is that we are all endowed with a moral sense, with a sociable instinct. That is, we come together naturally. What pushes us apart are unnatural, artificial relations of rule and power. And so he expected that there is something as there is in the case of the economy in the market or in society. Society is natural, as Thomas Paine said. It's government that's unnatural. So if you begin to erect a regime on top of the natural tendency of people to come together, the union that is spontaneous, that expresses our nature, then you can build a polity, a regime that lasts forever. And that metaphor of or the talking about thousands and thousands of generations is talk about what a nation would be, a great family of family across the generations. And I think that's the foundation, the place to begin in talking about private and public. It's not incidental for Jefferson that he thinks he is enacting and performing his natural responsibilities as the patriarch of his plantation family. And that's the foundation 
of an enduring republic. It's been from families to communities up to the nation. And he's saying that this is a natural way of doing it, whereas what he destroyed, what he and the other revolutionaries destroyed, was this unnatural regime, regime. And it's so critical to think about how he saw himself as a revolutionary, as a person who was supposed to be upholding the ideals of that, that would free people to be able to put that kind of system into place. That's what animates him. I say often that you know, we're, we think about Jefferson and we think about slavery, obviously, as we should, and we think about race, as we should, but his a real obsession was the United States of America and the American Revolution and his role in that. And so he's seeing everything through that. What, what kinds of things were Americans free to do because we've taken because we got rid of the old regime. And family formation, families that were, I think, were equal in that sense, were important. They were central to the new way of doing things. So he sees public and private as being together. And, well, well, he liked to think that his private life should be his private life. But he understood. He understood. There are some letters that indicate he understood that having stepped into the arena, that this was what was going to happen to him. Uh, that he would, people would pay attention to his private life. I'm sure you probably know of uh, a person who writes to him in the, the 18 teens about asking him the names of his grandchildren. And he says, why do you want to know the names of my grandchildren? That would just bore people. That has nothing to do with who I am as a public person. But his conception of public life, a Republican life, definitely depended upon some idea that families were important, families linking together, and then, as he said, up to the nation. So it's all mixed together, what he's doing. And he, the other thing about him, too, is that even though he talks so much about being with his family, he spent a good part of his adult life away from his family uh, and doing things that he thought would ultimately be for their benefit, but in but actually kept him away from the thing that he said that he loved the most, that is to say Monticello. Well, and I have always imagined that he thought, you know, his vision sort of looked like uh, little Monticello's from sea to shining sea. So there's this kind of notion that a man should be free to live a happy life and provide for his family, and you could do that on the land. Mm -hmm. right. you know? mm -hmm. And there's also important to keep that idea of morality to the fore. It's the last thing we think about when we think about a slave owner. Mm -hmm. Morality, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, but Jefferson believed that morality, he wrote in 1792 in a letter on the French treaties, he said that the, the font of wisdom is written and inscribed in the heart of man. And that same morality that can be, that is natural to us, that if you examine yourself unfiltered and you're honest with yourself, well, you can scale that up, and that as nations should act according to their, to the moral understanding which, which is natural to all people. That notion of scaling up, I think, is crucial to making the connections we're talking about, uh, as Annette suggested before, when you scale up from the home to the ward or the township to the county to the state to the nation, Morality does not change at all of those levels. Well, and especially if you do it um, by factors of 10 each time. So this well, kind of regular. Go. <laughs> very, very good. That's a Jefferson expert. <laughs> so, um, so just thinking about that and thinking about the way in which you've tried to take Jefferson on his own terms, and I think that's a hard thing to do in the world today. Uh, no one would know better than the two of you, I'm sure, but you know, anybody who studied Jefferson, you walk in, you say you're going to talk about him, and automatically it's like you've lobbed a grenade into the room. And because Jefferson comes to us now with freight that he did not have necessarily at the moment when both of you started studying him. So I want to go back a second and then, you know, uh, you know, start back and ask you both about your remarkable careers as scholars of the life and legacy of Thomas Jefferson. What got you into the Jefferson business in the first place? And then I want to talk a little bit about how the changing, our changing politics, the, the rapid changes in the world that we live, that we live in, um, how you feel like the, the conversation around Jefferson has changed since then. Well, I would start by saying that Jefferson has always been a lightning rod. Even before he died, 
Uh, the first, his first biographer notes that he was a controversial figure. There were people, there were always people who hated Jefferson and people who loved Jefferson. And depending upon where we are in American history, he stands for one thing for some people and something else for others. So he's always been a controversial figure. I became interested in Jefferson as a third grader, uh, reading a child's biography of Jefferson. And it was my first thought about slavery as an institution and thinking about this person who um, loved books, loved to learn. And I, and I tell the story of the, the person who is the individual describing Jefferson in this book is told through this enslaved boy who is sort of given a different personality. He's portrayed as unserious, not interested in learning. He's always exasperated with Jefferson because Jefferson wants to read a book and, you know, why can't we go fishing? He's childlike, essentially. It's sort of a stereotype of African American people. And I could tell from that that, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be that person who is unserious, not interested in science, dull, all those kinds of things because I'm black and Jefferson is white. This was a story not just about Jefferson. This was a story about whiteness and blackness conveyed for children that was supposed to send this other message in the guise of telling the story. And so from that, I began to read other books later on and I read Fawn Brody's book and with the Jordan's book and so forth and talking about Jefferson. And I got a sense that this same kind of argument was going on in a way that Jefferson represented something. He was his representation. That was my thinking that it was not a person, not just, he didn't just mean something as an individual. He was a symbol to certain people. And so that's how I got in, in, into the business of writing about Jefferson. I wrote my first book after reading all of the commentary about um, the movie Jefferson in Paris that was going to treat the Hemings story as real. And everybody would say, oh, this is ridiculous. You know, there's no evidence this. And I wanted to sort of write a book where I talked about the presentation of evidence. And I think it, it wasn't consciously in my mind that this, going back to the third grade experience, but it was an idea that, you know, history is written in a particular kind of way. And you're telling a story that's beyond just the facts by the way you assemble the story. And so my first book really was trying to dismantle um, a picture of life at Monticello that I thought was unrealistic and that told another story about African American people and the nature of slavery much larger than that through the denial of this story and the not acceptance of Madison Hemings's recollections and Israel Gillette Jefferson's uh, recollections about life at Monticello in which they said that Jefferson had a long-term connection to Sally Hemings and a bunch of kids with him. So that's how I got into it. Well, I have a complicated answer. It doesn't begin in the third grade. Uh, <laughs> there is a fam familial dimension to it, however. I'll start by saying uh, it was out of self-defense. Uh, I got a job at the University of Virginia, and I didn't have any choice about it. Uh, so that's the first law of nature is self-defense. Uh, that is, uh, I was hired to replace the distinguished Jeffersonian Merrill Peterson, uh, and uh, I eventually became a Jefferson professor. But the second answer is uh, I'm going to invoke my brother Nick, who's not here, unlike my brother Chris. My brother Nick is an international relations theorist, and he helped me uh, find a new direction on Jefferson, and I would also say meeting Annette and meeting her work uh, also was transformative for me. All things being equal, I would give Jefferson a wide berth. I come from New England. <laughs> I mean, like all we have in common with Jefferson is Unitarianism. Uh, but uh, I would be a Federalist. But, uh, and it helped me rethink Jefferson, but my brother Nick did too, because what made Jefferson make sense to me on the issue of slavery was to think about the categories of the law of nations and international law, and to think about how Jefferson might have understood the presence of enslaved people in Virginia. People who should not have been there. He knew that slavery was a radical injustice. 
it had to be rectified in the fullness of time. That's an important asterisk because, well, time has a way of extending far into the future for thousands and thousands of generations. But in the fullness of time, it had to be rectified. And as you know, and as students of Jefferson know, but I'll explain briefly to those of you who have been able to avoid Jefferson for all these years, Jefferson believed that it was important to emancipate enslaved people, but not sufficient to emancipate them, because they constituted a captive nation in the midst of white Virginians, a people without a country, a people in the country of Virginians. I like to say a very short definition or explanation of the American Revolution is that one people, that would be British Americans, part of the British people, a greater Britain that extended across the Atlantic, one people became two with the Declaration, but two people became three because in the midst of war, as enslaved people threatened to mobilize as part of the counter-revolution, along with those merciless savages on the frontier, Jefferson became acutely aware of what we call racial difference Race and nation are very closely aligned terms in Jefferson's time. They're very hard to distinguish. For him, the race of enslaved people, defined by blackness or some association with blackness, that was a captive nation held in chains, coerced to be in peace. It's kind of a cold war. But that Cold War ended with the American Revolution, or threatened to end, and that war took place on Jefferson's plantations with his own enslaved people escaping to British line and becoming part of the counter-revolution. Think of Jefferson dealing with a problem in international relations, and that's my brother's fault, because that's what he does. And then think of a state of war, and then think of the possible resolution of state of war and imagine that Jefferson has a moral sense that there must be a just resolution. How would that resolution take place? How could there be peace among the nations? Well, the British and the Americans can sit down in Paris and come up to, with an agreement. How about the enslaved people who are in this state of war, verging on a hot war, but they're in place in Virginia? We think of Jefferson as an agrarian who loves the land and all that land. You talk about Virginia available for future generations. Well, what if you're not actually working the land? What if the tools of labor, your labor, is an enslaved labor force? It's the negation of this fantasy of an agrarian republic. They must be removed. Now, we call that removal now deportation. We call it something horrible and violent. We associate it with that fantasy of colonization. But for Jefferson, it represented the ultimate and only moral solution to the problem of slavery. And that is, they must be sent someplace else where they can be a free and independent people. I keep referring to my necktie because it's vitally important to my very sense of being, and I only lecture in it. But in what Jefferson says in the notes on, on the state of Virginia, where he lays out this solution to the problem of slaves or slavery, is that we will declare them independent. That's like the pursuit of happiness. We pursued happiness. We will make them happy. We will make them independent. Then we could meet them at some moment in the future on the basis of equality because those nations would confront each other each with a country of its own and then achieve peace and justice that is something that we think is totally objectionable but it has to be understood remember I talked about scaling up morality for Jefferson that is a moral solution mm -hmm. and that's the thing that's the problem the genesis of a problem with him because our understanding of how we are as Americans of the goal that we say we would like to achieve is the antithesis of that. We understand that African Americans have been here, um, most African Americans have been here since you know, the 1730s. 
uh, the, the descendants of people who have been here for a very, very long time. It doesn't make any sense to think of another home that they should be going to. But for him at that particular time, he's saying that there's not any real way that these groups of people can actually live together without conflict. We're never, and he says it, you know, we're not, whites aren't going to give up their prejudices. There are differences between us that can't be resolved. You know, they can't be one family because he can't say it. You know, that blacks and whites can't be a family. Uh, and blacks would never forgive us for the things that we've done. This is a lot of projection on his part. He's sort of thinking of African Americans, particularly African American men, as potential soldiers, as people who would be angry about what had happened, and we're never going to get along. And so he is, you know, criticized for that. But it's not as though it hasn't been a difficult road. And it's not as though that's a question that we don't, we're having now about people who still have this question about whether or not we can be one people. So that's, you know, that's his solution to all of this. And that's his understanding about race and nation. And it's, as I said, anathema to the story that we like to tell ourselves about where we are and what we are. So on one hand, we have Jefferson as sort of writing the creed of America with the Declaration of Independence, things that African Americans have used, you know, pe other people of color, gay people have used, every group that wants to see itself as a part of the American story uses that document. But then there's this other document that talks much more, I think, more in some ways realistically about the way people actually feel about this question of race and the question of white supremacy that is out there in the open, that there has to be some kind of separation between the two people, and then maybe something, you know, maybe something could happen from there. So, um, well, and the chilling resonances for our own time, I think. Well, um, yeah, yeah think about yes. It. And as you were talking about declarations, I was thinking about Seneca Falls in 1848, and, you know, which borrows directly from the Declaration of Independence and that kind of unfinished business. But it would be pretty hard to do a separatist uh, solution on patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, Very just tough. women and men divide. <laughs> okay, you, know, you, just I don't, you know, that's one women. that, I mean, I remember in the 1970s in Northern California, maybe, you know. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, maybe not. No, Southern Oregon is probably about as far as... You mean in the state of Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's exactly right. Um, so I think it's about time for us to open it up to um, to the audience for questions. So uh, let's hear what you, what you have to say. <laughs> Sherry Burr. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm going to, I'll repeat your question. Okay, okay great. Okay. So my question to both of you is, can you talk about your research, writing, and editing process as co-authors, how you pull that all together for this book? Yeah, deference is the key word. All right, so here's a, the question is, uh, they're collaborators um, on, on most plus of the, uh, the patriarchs, and, uh, and uh, historians are notoriously individualistic. So how'd you do it? <coughs> <laughs> Go ahead, tell all. Well, tell all. Well, I would say... He turned off her mic. <laughs> he turned off, he turned off <laughs> her mic. <laughs> so like him. Um, well, what we tried to do was to achieve one voice in writing the book, because that's what Bob, our editor, wanted us to do. So instead of what I think a lot of historians do when they collaborate, who say, well, okay, you take one chapter, and I'll take the next chapter, and we would write sections of the book and then give it to the other person to rework. Okay. And we did that and it worked very, very well. I think the, I, was, I say sometimes the only time that there was, could be a problem, there was one section when I kind of got busy doing other things and, or if he was busy doing something else, if he went too long, it's difficult to say if someone has written a lot, <laughs> to say, I don't like that or can you change this? And we never said, I don't like that, but can you change this? So we tried to go section by section and really keep, uh, keep, keep close tabs on one another. We did Skype sessions beforehand. Uh, I've listened to him a lot, so I kind of know what he sounds like. And I actually... <laughs> I don't have a clue. No, I kind of know what he sounds like, and I listened to a number of his lectures on YouTube to also sort of get a sense of a voice. So even when I'm writing, to write not just necessarily the way that I would write, but what could be within the realm of what he might say, so or the, the way he might say something. So um, keeping, keeping the, the writing session short, 
keeping in contact with the person and not going too far. That's one way we did things. And then I deferred if there was ever a, 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 a dispute. Well, I'm a, a serial collaborator, though, uh, as I've told and have often and said in public, she's my last collaboration uh, because I've now written my very last book. So this is a valedictory moment. It's uh, Virginia's swan song. And uh, before we leave, we have to have a round of applause for her. I thought that was missing, but we'll, we'll, we'll stage that later on. But for me, collaboration is the extension of friendship by other means. Uh, and uh, I guess in my sappy, increasingly sentimental heart, as I get older and older, the cranky old man uh, uh, embraces the idea, a Jeffersonian idea, of, well, natural sociability. And uh, we were collaborating many years before we collaborated. It's uh, now, uh, how long have we been doing this thing? A quarter century that we have been talking with each other. And it began with my reading her first book and loving it. And uh, the, it's all been our history since then. So. Uh, she may listen to my voice, I don't know. It's, uh, I, I think those voices are tangled, and they're in there, and it's hard to separate them. And I know I'm sounding ridiculously sentimental. There is hard work in writing there. Oh, yeah. It's not easy, and to achieve that sense of a unified voice is not easy. But as a labor of love and friendship, um, I strongly recommend it, but you better have good friends to collaborate with. And my brother Nick, I mentioned, I've written two books with him, and when he said, I won't write any more books with you, I was deeply hurt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's interesting that historians don't do it th more often. I understand the, you know, I've always thought of myself as a writer, and that's sort of a solitary kind of thing, and it's a romantic thing, and you're going off to your room and doing various things. But he's written about Jefferson and paid much more attention to certain aspects of Jefferson's life. I've written about Jefferson and paid more attention to other aspects. So I think it was a great, that dread word, synergy, to have us come together and in a quick way, I mean, to be able to educate the other person about an area. You know, it would take much longer to go and figure all these things out on your own. And it's sort of interesting that historians who don't, who might have, have projects that could be done together, the way economists do things, the way everybody else in the world seems to do things, with collaboration to sort of make the, the sum better than the, than the parts and make it and, and um, get value out of that. Okay. So that's, you know, that's the way I approached it and the way we've approached it. And I'd make a further suggestion that we, neither one of us is a biographer as such. Uh, I, in fact, called myself an anti-biographer when I wrote the, a book about Jefferson's political thought. But in reading the Hemingses of Monticello, I thought that was a brilliant biography of Jefferson. Among other things, of course, her subjects were the Hemingses of Monticello, and quite rightly so. And she did a, a brilliant job of bringing these characters to the fore and letting us, enabling us to understand them. But in the process, of course, biographies don't exist in isolation. And they, they are the result of social relations. And so I had Jefferson thinking a lot. She had Jefferson living a lot. And between those two oblique approaches to biography, uh, I, we tried to write a life. That is, neither one of us started with the ambition. I did not want to grow up to be a biographer. Uh, that, that would be disgraceful. <laughs> Jack Green would disown me because, <laughs> because he doesn't do people, and I never do people until Jefferson came along, and I didn't consider him a person. Really. <laughs> More questions, up there. You spent a lot of your life writing about Jefferson, and you wrote about him in the Civil War, and then well, I mean, at the time, there were African American people who thought that that was, in fact, the solution. Um, the American Colonization Society was really just mainly a way of trying to get rid of free blacks, um, and 
but as I said, there, there were some blacks who felt that that was the way to go. And certainly later on, Marcus Garvey and others, even today, that there are blacks who feel that this is not going to work. <laughs> And have you know gone back to had places in Ghana, in particular in Kenya, and places where African American and in South America as well have become expatriates. It's not a crazy idea. I mean, if you think about the idea of people who had come over to the United States voluntarily to start a colony and start a society here, to think that people who had been forcibly brought here may not want to stay here. Uh, that's crazy to us because we've been here a long time. Uh, but it's not insane. Now, one thing I always say when we talk about this question is Jefferson, at the end of his life, in his will, talks about when he's freeing members of the Hemings family in his will, and he asked the legislature, as he had to do in order for them to stay there, is to allow them to remain in Virginia because that's where their families and their connections are which is a, sort of a fascinating thing, is the people that whom he knows intimately. Right. A lot, at the same time, there were a lot of slave owners who were freeing people in, in Virginia on the condition that they go to Liberia. So that was something that was available to him. If he actually believed that that, in his heart of hearts, that that was the way to go, he could have said that. He could have said, Burrell Colbert, you people, you are free, but you gotta go to Liberia, but he says no let them stay here because this is where their families and their connections are because he knew them and he cared, loved them in the way that he could love somebody and so he's the, the sort of abstract theoretical idea about what should happen which doesn't mean that he didn't believe that but there are a lot of things that you think are the right answer intellectually but when it comes to the heart and it comes to the particular moment and those people he's not doing what those other slave owners are doing you're free and then you got to go to africa you're free and you get to stay in Virginia because I know what this will mean to you. Your connections are here, your families are here, and this is where you belong, which of course is the answer to why every other black person in Virginia who wanted to stay there uh, should have stayed because that's where their families and their connections were. This is a profound question of identity and the very idea of an American identity, of course, is an invention of this period. It's highly precarious. It, it's not as if there is such a thing as Americans, and Americans then say, okay, we're gonna be independent. They don't know they're American until they make themselves American at this moment. And even as Jefferson and his fellow Americans are launching on this Republican experiment, an experiment in nationhood that could easily and some of us think should easily have failed, and it almost did in the Civil War, as a kind of failure of the American Union, uh, so too the identity of Africans is an invention. It's an invention of the Af African diaspora. And uh, African Americans who insisted on that hyphenate identity, the free people of the North when they established churches and communities of their own, were asserting a claim to and an attachment to the land, the land that they had cultivated uh, perfectly naturally. And Jefferson knew that at some deep level, as Annette is suggest suggesting. I think that's what makes this period so fascinating, because it is a period of identity construction, and that makes a big difference. It's, not, it's a period in which the very idea of the people emerges for the first time in Western history, if not world history. That is, we can identify ourselves collectively as what? Americans? And of course, that notion of people is both enables us to create a free and just society, but it enables us also to go to war with each other. And here we are at Jefferson inventing an identity, as Gary Wills put it, inventing America, even as slave owners and slave traders in effect, invented Africa. Yeah, and there's a wonderful book, a very long book by one of his students uh, called The Common Cause by Robert Parkinson, and he talks about this process of creating an identity of Americans and when it begins. And he's talking about the revolution when as soon as the shots are fired and we're conquered, the first people that they turn around and say we gotta get control of are the black people in the town, looking with suspicion towards them. And so you're already carving up 
this idea of who is an American, who's not an American, who's going to be part of all of this. But at the same time, as Rob clearly shows, you know, the story of African Americans joining the English, joining the British to fight for their freedom is sort of displayed quite a bit throughout the colonies, but the story of African Americans on the Patriot side is not. I mean, so the newspapers are full of stories about um, the, the black traders versus the story of blacks who were patriots. And that, that there should have been some indication of how African Americans at that particular time, how they were willing to go, that it was not just a question of, of revenge against the people who had enslaved them or were enslaving their brothers down in the South. It was a question of, we want to be a part of this too. We're willing to do our part. We're willing to die. We're willing to, to fight for the country if we're given a fair shot. So this is a, it's a very, very interesting way of, of uh, interesting look at the way people formed identity and the idea of white supremacy that we don't talk that much about, uh, how this is as much a part of the understanding, the original understanding as republicanism, as all of those kinds of things. As they're, as they're shaping the country. I suggested that race and nation are synonymous terms mm -hmm. to, to some extent. Can they be separated? And can the term race be neutralized in political terms? Well, obviously, about yes. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's useful to understand the fluidity of uh, identity <coughs> and uh, the protean character of <laughs> crucial terms that we take to be given as, well, race is the American dilemma, as Gunnar Myrdal said. Well, yes, it is and has been. That's our history. But does it have to be? Yeah, well, I mean, and we get, we've been talking about this much longer than Europeans who are sort of being roiled by this question now about identity, uh, about you know, who can be Swedish, who can be English, who can be you know, a part of that nation. And this is something that we've been talking about from the very, very beginning. So I'm going to act as, I'll take the privilege of the interlocutor and ask a question here. Um, this is a Western History Lecture Series. Uh, we tend to look at the history of the United States from what I have come to call the corner lands. Uh, so, you know, here we are out in this southwest corner, kind of looking at it, America, this way, and asking the question from the point of view of, you know, this question about an identity of race and nation um, from a little different place, which is, who counts as, where is the United States? Who counts as an American citizen? What are the privileges and immunities that uh, appertain to a person? And so we've begun to kind of see these questions of American expansion and slavery and freedom all in, as not two stories, one that's about the mm -hmm. winning of the West and the others that, that's about the emancipating of, of enslaved people in the South. And, the unfinished business of Reconstruction, but really one story about who the heck we are. Yeah, yeah, and well, Jefferson is a perfect person to explore this question because even though he never went past, you know, was it Harper's Ferry? I mean, he's not very far, he didn't go very far right. west right. in his life. He, um, he looked west all the time. He looked west all the time. <laughs> well, I think he yeah. went to a hot springs for his yeah, boils. Yes, yeah, yeah, that was him. Yeah. Yeah. He never went, but he had a, a vision, and visionary, and in those days visionary was seen as a bad thing, and maybe it is now too. And he's looking at, he's looking at the West, and he's sort of dreaming about the West. Maybe the woolly mammoth is out there. Uh, who knows? Uh, Dancing demons on spirit man. Right? Exactly, favorite, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, this, he's perfect to look at this because he sees and thinks that we're going to have to have, or we're going to have to have a country that went from one ocean to the next. And that was his great dream of all of that. And, he had a vision for Native Americans, which we haven't talked about very much, which was really about, unlike Africans, was about assimilation. Assimilation or annihilation, well, essentially. Take your Removal. pick. Take your pick. That's one of the things. Either we can become one family, our blood, our blood will run in each other's veins. Or we'll drive you off the continent. Or you you know, you because this is the march of progress in his understanding of the way progress was obtained. You know, you go from one stage to the next. Well, and they could be brought into the fold, or they would die out, and that was his, his solution. Africans, you can't say that. Africans, you can't talk about mixture, becoming one people. Someone writes to him, his secretary, William Short, writes to him uh, from Europe and says, I have the solution 
to the problem of slavery. We should marry them, oh, essentially. We should marry them and breathe them out, essentially. We will essentially look like Spanish people. And, and aren't they handsome? And they're attractive people. And that's the thing to do. And it's a Jefferson. He said, what do you think about that? And of course, he never answers. Uh, he asked them this four times. And in the span of you know the time it takes to go back across the, uh, the Atlantic with these letters, and he doesn't give him a response to all of that. But for Native Americans, that's the notion of assimilation as a possibility, not with African Americans. Well, Virginia, I want to assure you that this entire lecture has been a lecture in Western history, and you have not <laughs> betrayed your trust <laughs> in your last uh, performance here before your audience, but. Uh, uh, the title of the book, Empire, is a key word, uh, and we suggest this, we don't play it out fully. Uh, I think there are two words we could think about, and that suggests as much when she talks about the continent, uh, and you know the Continental Congress, the Continental Army. Think of the hubris, the overreach of imagining that these few straggling colonies along the Atlantic seacoast were somehow equivalent to or as they say in poetry, synecdoche for the entire continent, and therefore there's a destiny because we are in this particular position. How do you get that idea? And as Annette's been suggesting, you get that idea because you have a conception of the progress of mankind, and the empire moves west, and that notion of manifest destiny is not the invention of John L. O'Sullivan, 1845, in the Democratic Review. It is imminent in the whole project of colonization that goes back to the beginning. West, of course, is simply a directional signifier. It's relative to what? If you, you don't have a West without an East, and it's the East that's responsible for the West. It's the movement from the East to the West. It's the dynamism of that movement. Now, Jefferson disguises this to some extent by talking about the newness of the American experiment in self-government, because this is going to liberate the whole stupid world. But no, he's also thinking about empire. And empire is something that every Anglo-American had experienced before 1776. If you want to understand that continuity across generations, across time, across the continent, you have to go back to the history of colonization itself and how it was fundamentally premised on the appropriation of the land for productive uses, higher uses, Europeans would say, and the appropriation of labor to yield those productive uses. The United States of America makes no sense unless you see it as a continuation of the British Empire. And so, of course, American liberties are in the empire of liberty. Those are new Republican versions of British liberties. So that notion of newness and discontinuity, which is fundamental to our collective identity, it's the myth of American nationhood, is in fact disguising and covering a deeper continuity, which is the ongoing history of the expanding West. So there's a question, Sam Truitt. I, I just want to pick up on everything that you guys have been saying here. I mean, I'm interested in hearing how Jefferson and his cohort thought about the removal of black people from the body politic and the removal of native peoples. I'm thinking the Shawnee and mm -hmm. the Cherokee, for example. But within a context of empire, because empires tend not to worry so much about purity. I mean, mm -hmm. empires are all about sort of maintaining well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're British, and there's a very different understanding about race uh, among British people than the Spanish and the French. And this notion of purity, the notion of whiteness, is not to say that the French weren't racist and the Spanish weren't racist, but that maybe people may be attributed to religion, the different religion or whatever, but there's, in the British Empire, even the colonies, you're black or you're white. And if you're not white, you're not gonna be a part of it. There's no notion of giving people even any sense of a kind of middle ground. I mean, the French were very clear in their colonies in the Caribbean 
about having a buffer class of mixed race people who would identify with whites. And so it's not like they were promoting it, but they saw it as something that was, it, it had a meaning to them. It was something that was useful, but the British don't have, I mean, the kind of figures who could exist in French colonial society, I, I talk about um, uh, a, a French, a, a black man who was the Chevalier de Saint George, who was from the colonies, who came to Paris, and he, you know, was in high society, he played the violin, he was, Marie Antoinette went to watch him play the violin, you know, he had affairs with women, you know, French women, that couldn't happen in the United States. That kind of figure could not exist in the United States of America. So, I mean, this notion of, of an empire, I mean, the notion of purity just seems to be something, I mean, Winthrop Jordan wrote a lot about this in mm -hmm. White Over Black, trying to figure out what it is about British, English people that had this very, very sharp understanding about the meaning of race, of white and black, and cared. They, they wouldn't want to have an empire. That they, they couldn't tolerate an empire that assimilated people. And this notion of removal for Jefferson and others was a central part of it. I think one of the things that you might keep in mind, Sam, is the distinction between what we used to call the first and second British empires. And it's fact, the British Empire minus the new United States that becomes an empire of diversity. Mm -hmm. And that for Victoria to be the Empress of India, for the British people to feel this, uh, the sun never sets on their empire. And of course they rule over and in collaboration with darker skinned people. So heterogeneity is foundational to that British empire. But it's the com and as the Americans claim, the Patriots claim, they were more English than the English in defending their rights in the run-up to the American Revolution. In some ways, if you want to use pathological language, the pathogen of white supremacy flourished in the remnant part of the British Empire in North America, and then it got new impetus with Western expansion. Well, I would also say, too, the difference between you know, her being the emperor, empress of, of India is that India is over there, right? The Indians are over there. They're not in London. They're not in those places. Americans are living cheek by jowl. Virginia is 40% black during Jefferson's time. That's a very different thing. I mean, the people in, in Jamaica, there are a handful of English people that can go there and make their fortune. They come back to England. Uh, this is the settler colony, the, the notion of living with these people that you're ruling over creates a different uh, different feeling about things. You've had your hand up quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I was curious if you could discuss sort of, um, you talked about patriarchy and how Jefferson sort of um, sees this as more normal than uh, the aristocracy and the hierarchical, hierarchical organization of society. So sort of how does he come to define uh, what is normal and what's natural and, and what isn't? And so, um, if you could just talk about that, that would be really interesting. Well, it doesn't seem natural to you, does it? <laughs> and we see how it's constructed in the law. But this is the thing. What do you think is natural now? Make a list of all these things and put it in a bottle. And let somebody read it sometime in the future. Things are always naturalized. Historians, cultural historians will tell you. Let's start with the idea of what your people in the time you're studying think is natural, normal, we might say normal as well as natural, normative, uh, and uh, that is precisely what we study. But when we talk about the threshold of the natural, what is natural, then of course we're talking about what's foundational. I mean, the anthropologists would say, well, what people think is natural, that's of course what's really important. It doesn't mean that it's universal. It's the delusion that what we take to be natural is universal that leads to our confusion. I was talking to my daughter today about um, her, she got a check in our home and my husband said, I could just go to the bank and deposit it for you. And, and she said, you can deposit money for me without my being there. He said, yes, you can do that with a check, but not with, um, uh, not with cash. And she said, no, 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 this is kind of unsettling to me. And, she, and I, I, my account is linked to hers in a way so that I can put money in her account. And I said, you know, that seems more unnatural to me than going to the bank, signing my name for deposit only, and putting it in. Because that's the way I grew up. 
and that seems much more, it's taken me a long time to get used to this idea of sending money around just by pressing buttons and so forth to different places. So it's, it's what you're used to. He thinks what is natural is what, <laughs> is what happened to him when he grew up. And he, but interestingly enough, this is the fascinating thing about him. At some point, he, there's some things that about, about his society that he could rose to think are unnatural. And that's why he becomes a revolutionary. So the real interesting, interesting thing to him is about what, how does he decide that this thing, these things are natural and these things are unnatural. And a lot of it has to do with his adherence to the Enlightenment, thinking of himself as a progressive, a person who believed in science, who was anti-organized religion, and anti-slavery was sort of the package, you know, if you're a liberal, if you're conservative, there's sort of a checklist of things that you think you're supposed to believe. Some of them you believe more than others, but those, that was his self-image. I mean, there's a story about him, probably an apocryphal story about him eating a tomato on the courthouse steps when people thought that tomatoes were poisonous. That's sort of a symbolic understanding of who, the role that he played in people's minds, and that this was somebody who was a harbinger of something that was new. And he saw himself that way. But of course now we look at him and he looks incredibly conservative. But there were people back at the time who thought he was way out there. So let's talk about the harbingers here, because I do actually, um, here as we approach the end, I do want to, uh, with all this talk <coughs> about purity and about separation of the races and about uh, nationhood, um, I find myself feeling the weight of that, his actual lived experience and his biracial family uh, sitting very uh, uh, heavily on my own uh, consciousness and thinking about his sons, Esten and Madison Hemings, Esten who became Esten Jefferson, who were in many ways, um, they were living out his dream. Uh, because they were going to go and be the patriarchs or founders of families uh, further west in the American Empire. Could you say a little something about all of these ideals that he's holding in his head at the same time? And the fact, I know, Annette, this is your next project, so I want to lead this uh, to them. Everybody getting ready to buy your next book uh, when they're ready. Um, so say a little something about the lived experience of a biracial family that flies in the face of this very separatist kind of racial ideology and the fact that they're the ones who are going to carry his dream westward. Well, one of the things that uh, Senator Stanton, who I know you know, yeah. and Diane Swan Wright, and one of the things that they've written about is the sort of interesting notion that Jefferson's descendants through Sally Hemings actually were trying to live out the ideals of the Declaration more so than the descendants of his legal family. They're taking that notion, all men are created equal, to try to make it a reality. Um, yeah, I, I get questioned quite a bit about Beverly Madison and Eston and Harriet Hemings as um, Jefferson's children and why he did not treat them as his children in the most, I mean, you know, he, their names give some indication of their connection to him, but why they are not welcomed into the family sort of openly in a way, which obviously would be very difficult for him to do, or we, as I've said, we wouldn't be talking about him now because he would be like Richard Mentor Johnson, he would be sort of relegated to obscurity. Um, but, you know, by freeing them, letting them go, they are, by Virginia law, white, seven-eighths white, and so therefore they were considered white. And he said that people like that are free citizens of the United States of America, which he would have thought was the best thing in the world, obviously. And so if he had embraced them in the way that we would like for him to have embraced them, they would not have had the lives that they had. And one generation, I mean, Eston, Eston's sons are extremely wealthy people. Eston's son, John Wales Jefferson, is a lieutenant colonel in you know, the, the Union Army. He's at Vicksburg. He's writing back, back dispatches from there. He would never have been able to do that if Jefferson had identified, if he, they had identified themselves as the partly black children of Thomas Jefferson. We think that that's a big deal. That would have been nothing uh, to people at the time. 
And Eston actually gives that up when he goes to Madison and changes his name and changes his racial designation. That means his kids can go to school, they can belong to society, they can vote, they can do all the things that that citizens can do. So in exchange for that, you know, bouncing, you know, we, we would want Jefferson to bounce him on his knee and be my son and all that kind of thing. If he had done that, they would have been black people in a country that despised black people and would never have been able to do the things that they actually managed to do. So it's a, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about that mindset, you know, to think about what that must have been like to have sons who could not really be his sons 100%, but to understand that they would go on and be able in the succeeding generations to actually do something for themselves and live a life of dignity, which they couldn't have if people had identified them as black. And we don't have to think of the American people the way Jefferson did. He thought that was the only way you could think about it in that particular moment, in that context. And I think there's a key idea that's come up time and time again in our discussion, and that is the very idea of generation. Think of how it connects and equalizes among those people who are considered part of the people. And that notion of what a people is, is a social construction. And we are reconstructing our conception of nationhood. And that idea that Jefferson gives us, and very powerfully gives us, that the earth belongs to the living, that the generation of young people, it's their earth. Let's leave it to them in a way that the, they can improve and leave to future generations. But the requirement is that we obliterate distinctions among our children, that we don't think of or allow them to become privileged, to be, become a ruling class. Why can't that generation, that notion of generation, be expansive enough to get us beyond white supremacy? Not denying that white supremacy has been very much a part of our collective history, but it is our collective history. And if we're going to have a collective future, it has to be because we define future generations as being inclusive of all the young people. Because the very idea of a republic is meaningless if the people now living can't determine not only their future, but the future of their succeeding generations not destroying it, not wasting the earth that we have. It's very much, and this is why environmentalists embrace Jefferson and that notion that somehow we have a kind of stewardship. And that, at the end of the day, is what Jefferson says when he says the earth belongs in usufruct to the living generation because we have to keep it alive entire. We can't waste the collective estate, the commons. It has to be passed on. And at the end of the day, I think Jefferson, too, would admit thinking globally of the whole earth, that the whole world has a responsibility. Those people who are in a position to do something about it now, to leave something for the future. And I, I think that rather than wasting our energy in telling ourselves the obvious, that Jefferson is a racist son of a bitch and we can do without him, what do we take from Jefferson? That's the estate, that's the, that's the legacy. Take that idea, that idea of a nation we're never going to transcend the idea of a nation, but we can enrich it, we can enliven it, we can make it real, and we can make it work for us if we acknowledge that the nation is us, all of us. Well, I think you've given us a huge challenge. I think you've given us a great charge. You've certainly given us a great hour and a half. Thank you very much, Peter. <laughs>